Action! And we're off. 14 miles. <laughs> There's some life in this thing, come on! Oh, that hasn't gone well. Electric cars are great when it's hot and dry, but what happens when the temperature plummets and the heavens open? We've got 12 cars here, and we're going to drive them all in real-world conditions until they die. We're going to show you exactly what happens when electric cars run out of charge and how far all of these EVs will really go on a typical winter's day. And then at the end, we're going to crunch all the numbers to see how they stack up for efficiency. But before we start testing, make sure you hit subscribe for lots more videos like this one. Right, first things first, we've got to set these cars up. And because this is a relatively scientific test, we've got to make sure it's fair. So we want them in basically the same condition. So Dan, what are we doing with the tires? So all of them need to be at their recommended manufacturer settings. And that's what you're doing here? Exactly, yes. So I've got to attach the towing guard to these cars. Okay. So that when they run out of battery, we pull up to the side of the road, they're ready to be put into the trailer. So I've just been in every single car zeroing all of the trips. I've also set the climate control in each car to 21 degrees, and they're now all in eco drive modes. With all the cars set up for the test, it was time for the driver briefing. As always, because it wouldn't be safe to deliberately run cars out of charge on the public road, we recreated real world conditions at our private test centre in Bedfordshire. We followed a simple test route of roughly 15 miles, which included 2.6 miles of simulated stop start urban driving, 4 miles at a steady 50 miles an hour, and 8 miles at a constant 70. The rationale for the high percentage of high speed cruising is that drivers who want to travel long distances in one hit are likely to be using the motorway network. The evening before the test, the 12 cars were charged to 100% and then left out in the open for roughly 14 hours in 6 to 10 degrees ambient conditions. Just before we started the test, they were all plugged in again to check they were fully charged and then the headlights were switched on. The cars would be driven repeatedly around our test route in convoy, with driver changes and a switch in running order at the end of every lap, to make things as fair as possible. OK, Will, so what cars do we have here today? Well, the car that can officially go the furthest is the one I'm driving right now. That's the Tesla Model 3. It's recently been updated. This is the long range version, so the version that can go furthest on a charge. And the official WLTP figure for this guy is 390 miles. However, that is with the optional 19 inch alloys. This car has the standard 18 inch aero wheels. There isn't an official WLTP for that. Well, it's exactly the same as with the bigger wheels, but Tesla estimates 421 miles. So in theory, this should go the furthest. Okay, just behind it though, is the VW ID7, which I'm in now. And you aren't seeing double. We have two pretty much identical ID7s on this test. The big difference is though, one of them has a heat pump. The other one doesn't. So driving them both on this wintry day in real world driving conditions will let us see if having a heat pump really makes a big difference or not. Okay, so after that, we've got the Mercedes EQE, quite an expensive executive saloon. And actually we had one of those in our summer range test that we did a few months ago. And it went furthest of all of the cars that we had on that test, including the Tesla Model 3, although that was before the Tesla's updates. Next up, we've got the BYD Seal, which is a brand new Model 3 rival from Chinese company BYD. And we've already driven it on a long road trip and we were pretty impressed with it there, but how is it gonna do today? After that, we've got something that's quite a lot more expensive. It's the BMW i5. Very good electric car, there's no doubt about that, but it starts at 75,000 pounds. So the fact it's sort of middle of the pack when it comes to official range is maybe a little bit disappointing, but perhaps it will surprise us in the real world. Behind the i5, in terms of official ranges, we've got the Volvo XC40, which has just had a fairly major update, giving it a much bigger battery, and we've got a twin motor version on this test. Okay, so one of the cheapest cars in the whole test next is the MG4. It's actually the top of the range MG4. So the MG4 range starts at 27,000. This one is 36,500 pounds. It's called the extended range, and the official WLTP for that car is 323 miles and actually we used that on a road trip a few months ago against the tesla model 3 you can watch that video if you want by clicking the link up there at the top now if the mg4 represents brilliant value for money in the electric car world the next car might not it's the lexus ux and it's just had a fairly major update from lexus however it is still a fairly small electric suv which 
can only fast charge using a CHAdeMO connector. And the one that we've got here today is a Takumi UX, which costs £57,000. And it also has one of the worst ranges here. Bargain. So that's <laughs> almost twice as much money as the BYD Dolphin. So you've already mentioned we've got the BYD seal in this test. This is the much smaller Dolphin. It's a little bit smaller than the MG4, costs around £31,000. So when you factor that in, perhaps the range, one of the weakest here, but understandable when you consider the price. And really, you'd expect the seal and the Dolphin to be pretty good in wet conditions, wouldn't you, Will? But anyway, next, we've got the Lexus RZ which is another Lexus in this test, which is also extremely expensive. And it really stands out towards the bottom of the pack here. But you never know, it could surprise us today. Let's hope so. Okay, so after that, the final car is the Jeep Avenger. European car of the year, actually. Has the worst official range of all these cars, 244 miles. Perhaps it'll surprise us. It does come with a heat pump as standard. And obviously it's much, much cheaper than the RZ, although still, around about £40,000 just under, so not exactly a bargain. So Will, what's your money on to win this test? Well, as I said, I reckon the Tesla Model 3 probably has it in the bag. It's the long range version of that car. We know the rear wheel drive, we've tested that already, and that returns some fantastic efficiency figures. But given what we're seeing so far, only a few miles in, then the ID7, or at least one of them, could run this pretty close. And what do you think is gonna die first? I reckon it's a toss-up between the Avenger and the RZ. They've both got very similar official ranges. It really depends on which one deals best with these quite poor weather conditions. Obviously a lot of rain and reasonably cold temperatures today. Let's find out. Now, if you're watching this in Canada or Sweden or somewhere like that, you might be thinking, this is not a winter at all. It's currently 11 degrees according to the car, so not particularly cold. And in the UK, even in Scotland, you know, it rarely gets down to minus 10, minus 20, really cold temperatures like that. But still, this sort of temperature is not ideal for electric cars. They will go quite a bit further when it's 20, 25 degrees in the summer. And there's a lot more to contend with as well. So it's very windy today. That's not good for efficiency and it is pouring with rain. And there's a lot of standing water on the road as well, so these cars are having to push through that, which again is harming their efficiency and reducing how far they can go on a full charge. So Will, we've been on the road for a few hours now. The sun's come out, the rain's gone away for a bit. What car are you in at the minute? So I'm in the BYD Seal and I'm getting a little bit annoyed because every time I try and put the wipers on, I indicate because the stalk's the wrong way round. But there's better news when it comes to the range because at the moment I have 50% of battery left and the car is telling me I still have 177 miles left to go. How about yourself? Okay, that's pretty good. I was also doing a lot of accidental indicating in the Seal, but now I'm in the MG4. I've got 44% of my battery left with 111 miles of range, apparently. That is pretty good, I'd say, especially given the price. But do you reckon we were right about which of these cars would run out first? So we check in with the others? Okay, so it's between the Avenger and the RZ, isn't it? So let's find out what they're on. How many miles remaining in the Avenger? 52 miles. What about the RZ? It's down to 14 miles. 14 miles. So that's a 75, 77,000 pound electric SUV and it's gonna run out of juice quicker than a BYD Dolphin that's 31 grand <laughs> oh and a Jeep Avenger. <laughs> this, this MG4 is gonna be on the road for like another eight hours and the RZ will just be broken down. Do you think it will die pretty much when it gets to zero reading miles or will it get a second wind and do another 100 or so? No, I suspect it will get to zero and die there, but there's only one way to find out. Okay, so I am now in the Lexus RZ and I've just started a circuit which is around about 15 miles and the car is telling me I have seven miles left. So if that's correct, then we're going to run out completely 
on this journey. At the moment, we're doing very low speed stuff. We're doing the stop start at 30 miles an hour, but in a minute, we're gonna be doing 50 and then 70 miles an hour. And I expect that figure to start to go down very quickly. And if we don't run out this time, it's almost certain that we'll run out next. And guess who's in it then? And you know what? We're just pulling off the high-speed circuit. We've done 143.5 miles now. So that means I have made it round a full circuit. And it also means Doug Revolta is in the car next. And I think given that there is zero miles left according to the trip computer, there's a pretty good chance that he is gonna to have to deal with the car running out, which is quite funny. Great. It's been on zero miles for quite a while now, so let's see what happens. Okay, we've survived the town section at 30 miles an hour. Can we actually get up to 50 miles an hour? Performance is quite restricted, but we're almost there. 47, 49, <laughs> 50 miles an hour now. Okay, how long can this keep going? We've made it through the 50 mile an hour section, so now we've got to get up to 70. And we've been going <laughs> for 14 miles with the car saying that it has no miles remaining. But I am struggling to get up to 70 miles an hour. I'm at 56, 57. My foot is flat to the floor. 58. Oh, I'm getting overtaken by everyone. I'm losing power. <laughs> I'm dropping. I'm down to 59 miles an hour. 58. 55, I think this is going to be a really, really painful slow death now. 51, 50, my foot's still flat on the floor and we're just very slowly losing power. 49, oh no, oh, I really thought we stood a chance of making it a whole way round. Will, what's happening in the Avenger? I'm currently cruising at 36 miles an hour. I still have 1% of the battery okay. according to the car. So I reckon it's only a matter of time. Obviously I've done a couple more laps than you, so I won't be last, but I think I might be second from Foster. I think the recovery truck is going to be quite busy for the next hour. Okay, so the Avenger is actually the first one, certainly when you look at time to die, it's done 162 miles according to the trip computer, but the RZ started to drop off quite a bit sooner. So I reckon this has actually done more miles or will have done by the time that we finish. I've got my high-vis jacket on because this car needs to be now taken to a, oh, and I'm moving, I'm moving, I'm moving. Didn't expect that to happen. I'm going onto the tow truck. Well, we've been in limp mode for what feels like several hours now. We're still moving forwards at eight miles an hour. We've been on an empty battery for almost 20 miles. Okay, so the Avenger is first back at the charging points. So if we're talking about time, it was definitely the first to die, but I'm not sure if this will have covered more miles than the RZ because that car started to die quite a bit sooner than this, although I've heard that somehow it is still crawling around the circuit right now, albeit at about six miles an hour. So I think now it's about time we found out which of our cars went furthest and also we talked about how efficient they all are. So we're talking about range first, and then we're gonna cover efficiency. And as you've just seen, the Jeep was the first to fully die, but it actually still traveled further than the RZ. And the RZ trip computer was showing a remaining range of zero miles after just 136 miles. But it kept going for another 21 miles after that. Remember though, the last three miles were going at about nine miles an hour. So in total, it covered 157 miles, meaning that one of the most expensive cars on this test had the worst range of the entire lineup. So the Jeep Avenger was next. It does cost roughly half as much as the RZ, but it's still not exactly cheap. It costs almost 40,000 pounds. 
and it covered 163 miles. Now we should clarify at this point that we didn't just go by each car's trip computer because they were all reading slightly differently. So what we did was we took an average of the trip computer reading at 100 miles and then we adjusted all the figures accordingly. Yes, we did. And next to die was another Lexus. It wasn't a particularly good day for the Japanese manufacturer. It was the UX 300E and it was third to drop out covering 170 miles which was 37.9% short of its official range. And that was the biggest shortfall of any of the cars here. The other thing to mention about the UX is that the one that we had on test costs more than 57,000 pounds. And it's the only one of our contenders that uses the old fashioned Chadamo connector to rapid charge. And if you find a Chadamo connector and connect to it, then you need to wait for almost one hour and 30 minutes to get a 10 to 80% top up because the UX can only accept a maximum charging rate of 50 kilowatts. So not a particularly recommendable EV on the evidence of this test. Uh, next fallout of the running was the BYD Dolphin that managed 188 miles. Now, okay, that's not a particularly long range by modern electric car standards, but the Dolphin is a small, little urban run around it has a footprint about the same size as a bmw one series then that's a little bit more understandable and also it's the cheapest car here it costs 31695 and that's in the range topping trip sure the next eight cars all managed at least another 35 miles but it was the mg4 that went next and in total the mg4 extended range covered 227 miles which is pretty impressive for an ev that costs less than thirty-seven thousand pounds but it is the most expensive MG4 that you can buy alongside the X-Power. And really we do think, although it still represents good value for money, it's really the cheaper versions of the MG4 that are more recommendable and make more sense, even if they can't travel for quite as far on a full charge. Absolutely, I agree with that. So next drop out five miles later was the Volvo XC40 Recharge. Now this is the new updated one. It recently got a bigger battery and we were testing the twin motor version, so it's very quick. And that managed 232 miles. Not bad at all, although that was about 30% shy of its official WRTP range. The i5 was next. And to be honest, you might expect a better winter range than the 253 miles that it managed to cover because it costs almost 80,000 pounds. But the i5 did at least get relatively close to its official range. After that, it was the ID7 without the heat pump that dropped out the running just one mile later. And then another mile after that, it was the new BYD seal that fell out of the running. So the BYD seal has a pretty good range when you consider that it is much cheaper than cars like the ID7 and the i5 and it actually beat those cars, albeit by a small margin. And it was the ID7 with the heat pump, which finished third overall, and it managed an extra 14 miles on top of what the ID7 covered without the heat pump. And eventually the ID7 with the heat pump died after 268 miles. Okay, so the final two. There was only seven miles in it in the end, but sheer battery size did eventually win the day. So the Model 3 long range that managed 293 miles and the EQE managed 300 miles on the nose. But then when you consider that the EQE, as I said, has a much bigger battery, it has a 19% larger usable capacity. It costs almost £20,000 more to buy than the Model 3. Then perhaps such a small margin of victory isn't that great. And the Model 3 was also, by a country mile, the most efficient car that we had on test. And it averaged 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour. And the reason that efficiency is important is because if an electric car has a massive range, but terrible efficiency, then it's like having a fuel powered car with a massive tank that means it can travel 800 miles before you have to fill it up. But if it's doing 10 miles per gallon, then it's gonna cost you an absolute fortune. So you'd be better off having a car with a smaller fuel tank, which can't travel quite as far in one hit, but is much more efficient and would then cost you a lot less money. And a few years ago, when electricity prices were really, really cheap and any electric car was far cheaper to run than an equivalent petrol or diesel, efficiency wasn't such a big consideration. But electricity prices have skyrocketed, particularly you'll notice that if you're using a public charging network. So it's a much bigger consideration for buyers now, or at least it should be, and you might be surprised by the difference in running costs between the electric cars that we had on this test. You might. So if you take the Tesla Model 3, for example, as you mentioned, that was the most efficient car we tested. And if you were to charge that up exclusively at home at the current energy price cap, that's around 29p per kilowatt hour, then you would spend roughly 740 pounds in electricity every 10,000 miles. Now, of course, we know a lot of EV buyers use cheaper overnight tariffs. So let's just say for argument's sake, you were paying 7p per kilowatt hour. 
then that 10,000 miles would cost you 179 pounds. But on the other hand, if you were doing all your charging at a public charger at say 79p per kilowatt hour, now this is a Tesla, it has access to the supercharger network, so that's generally a bit cheaper, but let's base it on 79p per kilowatt hour, then you would be paying 2,021 pounds for every 10,000 miles you covered. And that's for a very efficient electric car. We've also got the numbers for the RZ, which not only had the worst range, but it was also the least efficient car that we had on test and it managed just 2.5 miles per kilowatt hour. So 10,000 miles in that would cost 282 pounds on the 7p overnight tariff, 1,168 pounds at the home price cap or 3,183 pounds if you're using the public charging network. So you could potentially be saving an extra 1,162 pounds on electricity every 10,000 miles by choosing an efficient EV over a thirsty one. Yes, and although some people might be thinking, well, those cars aren't direct rivals, you're comparing one large SUV against a much lower, sleeker executive saloon. But even if we look at more direct rivals, so take the BYD Seal, for example, that would cost you £197 more every 10,000 miles if you were charging at 29p per kilowatt hour, rising to £536 more if you were paying 79p for every kilowatt hour at a public charging station. So even though not all buyers do worry about efficiency when they're choosing an EV, they really should. And one final point on efficiency, we realised in this test that the trip computer what the car is telling you it's achieving isn't actually always right. So the numbers that we have, the efficiency calculations we've got, they're based on the actual miles that we covered divided by the usable capacity of the battery. And we found that the actual efficiency was in lots of cases very different to what the car was saying that it was achieving. Good point. So we found the efficiency meters in the BMW i5, the Jeep Avenger, the MG4 and the Tesla Model 3 were pretty much spot on. There were some big discrepancies. So the two BYDs, for example, they were wildly optimistic about their energy usage. Take the Dolphin, that was claiming 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour which was the same as the Tesla Model 3 was delivering much. Very impressive. Very impressive figure. But actually, when you calculate the numbers, it was only doing 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour. So that's an error of more than 20%. <laughs> and obviously nowhere near as impressive as 3.9 miles per kilowatt hour. N not at all. The energy meters in the two ID7s were also a little bit optimistic by a much smaller degree though. On the other hand, in the two Lexuses, the EQE and the XC40, the meters in those cars claimed they were delivering worse efficiency than they actually were. Very interesting, but what about heat pumps then? So we had two identical ID7s, one with a heat pump, one without a heat pump, and what did we learn from this experiment? So yes, heat pumps in theory are supposed to improve efficiency because they can pull heat from the ambient air and transfer that into the car's interior. So that's more efficient than using a resistance heater to warm up the cabin. Now, a lot of electric cars, a lot of our contenders came with one of these as standard, but in some cases, you have to pay extra. So on the ID7, you have to pay 1,050 pounds if you want a heat pump. That is quite a lot of money. The two cars, as you say, were near enough identical. They had the same wheels, the same tires, they were in the same trim. The only difference other than the heat pump was that the one with the heat pump also had a panoramic roof, so that would have added a little bit of weight, but we're talking small margins. Now, the heat pump did improve efficiency and range, as you mentioned earlier, so the efficiency was 5.2% better. It went from 3.3 to 3.5 miles per kilowatt hour. But the trouble is, even if you're doing all your charging on the public charging network and you're paying 79p per kilowatt hour, then you will need to do 85,000 miles before you've earned back that 1,050 pounds in electricity savings, and only then where you start to actually save money. And if you're charging at home, particularly if you're on a cheap overnight tariff, then you'll be doing half a million miles or more, which you probably won't even have the car then, the car will be in a scrap heap somewhere sure. before it's paid back the initial cost of the heat pump. Crazy, so if you get a heat pump as standard, then great. But if you have to decide to pay more to have one, then it probably won't actually add up. Potentially not. It is important to point out that this was on the day in different conditions, in cooler weather, perhaps with different cars, then the difference, the improvement might be slightly greater. But yes, absolutely is something worth thinking about. And obviously we do acknowledge that the temperature on the day wasn't minus 20, so it wasn't like we were conducting this test in a Nordic winter. But 
What was the average temperature for the actual testing that we were doing? The average temperature was between 10 and 11 degrees during testing. It was a little bit colder when we set the cars overnight. So clearly there are other countries in the world that have much harsher winters. This is specific to the UK. And as I mentioned earlier, even though it wasn't actually that cold, it was very wet, a lot of standing water, and it was quite windy as well. Sure. Okay, so there you have it. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you want to see another one, make sure you click that link up there. And to get more information on this test and all the cars involved, and if you want a great deal on your next car, go to whatcar.com by clicking there.